The Schools We Need and Why We Don't Have Them by E.D. Hirsch, Jr. Most current educational reforms are repetitions or rephrasings of long-failed romantic anti-knowledge proposals that emanated from Teachers College Columbia University in the teens, 20s, and 30s of the 20th century. The underlying assumptions of many break-the-mold reforms are anything but new. Remarkably, the disappointments of reform to date have not led educational experts to question the romantic principles on which their proposals are based, but rather to attack the messenger that is bringing the bad news, standardized tests. To express the socioeconomic implications of education in the modern world, sociologists have devised the useful concept of intellectual capital. The phrase has been used to denote the knowledge that makes the workers of one company or country more effective than those of another. Sociologists have shown that intellectual capital, i.e. knowledge, operated in almost every sphere of modern society to determine social class, success or failure in school, and even psychological and physical health. Just as it takes money to make money, it takes knowledge to make knowledge. Psychological research has shown that the ability to learn something new depends on the ability to accommodate the new thing to the already known. When the automobile first came on the scene, people called it a horseless carriage, thus accommodating the new to the old. When a teacher tells a class that electrons go around the nucleus of an atom as the planets go around the sun, that analogy may be helpful for students who already know about the solar system, but not for students who don't. Relevant background knowledge can be conceived as a stock of potential analogies. Under the current American educational system, the home is the decisive influence on academic outcomes. It is the home by default and not the school that supplies most of the intellectual capital which enables children to acquire more. When the home is the dominant influence in education, it follows that economically and educationally depressed groups will not be greatly advanced by schooling. Bad schools hold back disadvantaged children disproportionately because disadvantaged homes are typically less able than advantaged ones to compensate for the knowledge gaps left by the schools. Unfortunately, for several decades, the American educational community has operated under the guiding metaphor that every child needs to have the all-purpose tools. The particular content used to develop these tools need not be specified. The claim that all-purpose intellectual competencies are independent of the matter out of which they have been formed, if it corresponded to reality, would be an attractive educational idea. The chief aims of education would simply be to ensure that children acquired a love of learning and gained critical thinking techniques. The tool metaphor, with its encouragement of an indifference to specific knowledge, has resulted in social consequences of tragic proportions. Education professors continue to assume that teachers are giving lectures to docile classes lined up in rows are still forcing children to engage in rote learning and are still insisting on the mere accumulation of facts. Yet a visit to any of our public elementary schools will disclose that these denounced practices are rare. Hostility to academic subject matter has been the continued focus of educational reform ever since cardinal principles, a tradition that needs to be kept in mind when current reformers attack mere facts, and rote learning. The anti-subject matter viewpoint of cardinal principles has dominated the training and certification of teachers in our teacher training schools since the 1930s, that is, during the entire working lives of all persons now teaching in our schools. Their reform proposals continue to be based on a sincere but quite inaccurate belief that a fact-oriented classroom prevails in American public schools today, whereas in reality, 
the most striking feature of our elementary schools is that the anti-rote learning reforms being advocated are already firmly in place. The little rote learning that is to be observed consistently is the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. A daring teacher will occasionally ask pupils to learn poems or songs by heart, or even state capitals or foreign vocabulary words, but such practices are frowned upon. The continual beating of this dead horse illustrates the extreme disconnection between the stated evils that are said to need reforming and the actual practices of the American elementary schools. The repudiation of the supposedly deleterious overemphasis on subject matter is a reform that has already been in place for half a century. Cardinal principles, besides reducing the emphasis on academic subject matters, advocated another change that is still being promoted as a reform. Schools must pay more attention to the individual differences of children. Their varying abilities and learning styles must not be submerged under a single lockstep system of academic standards and teaching methods. I visited dozens of elementary schools without finding a single one in which sensitivity to the different individual talents and needs of children was not a concern of teachers. Nonetheless, a stress upon different learning styles and other individual differences continues to be presented as a highly, highly promising reform novelty. E.D. Hirsch Jr. is the Professor Emeritus of Education and Humanities at the University of Virginia.